So he's, it was sort of hanging in the in, in the air about whether it would happen or not. Richard was quite into it. Richard wanted to do this sort of thing where he wanted to lie a lot about his background, <laughs> and he wanted to go. He didn't want to go to the Ennis Road to Overdale, which we featured quite a lot. He wanted to go to a totally different part of town. Or he, wanted, he really wanted to lay on this sort of MacGuffins about, yeah. about his life, um, and the BBC were fascinated about that. So, but then he died on. It's funny because I was saying before we went in that um, I put an emotional connection with that that um, at the age of 11 or so I grew up three houses down from him. Uh, a house called Belmont in Ennis Road and my, uh, my stepfather was um, in school with him and his younger brother, Father Jimmy, was a Jesuit priest um, to be in Richard Harris' class. And uh, it was one of those things that he, 30 years later, he turned up in New York and went to stage door uh, or a camel off or someone and left note in and sort of thought, you know, he won't think about me, he hasn't seen me for 30 years, he won't care. And heard this clattering downstairs and the stage door bursting open and then, Jimmy, what could it have fallen? Jimmy! And put his arm down and took for a father Jimmy out for a night to never forget. Uh, I mean, to me, that sounds very much like Richard Harris because the, it was really important to make a Irish film. And he, you know, he left, but I, I think it was Stephen Ray that was telling me that he. You, you, you can leave Ireland, but you, you always leave part of it behind. Mm -hmm. and, and some of us come back. And Richard never actually came back to live in Ireland after his death. But the draw of Ireland was always there. And he called his house in the Bahamas Kilkey House. <laughs> and he would still get him to all his children back to Kilkey for holidays. And, uh, and I love Kilkey. I thought Kilkey was yeah. great. Um, talk a little bit about your opinions about one of the questions that run through the film, which is this contrast between Dickie and Richard, which is kind of was a theme that runs through. Right? Interestingly, um, Jim Sheridan in there says he didn't really fancy the idea of Dickie. He liked this <laughs> with Richard. Uh, and the son of Richard in effect, who they didn't really know. I don't like, like the Dickie, Dickie Harrison. Yeah. Like the fucking Dickie, Dickie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was very what did, what did the various people who say that mean by that distinction? Um, Elizabeth Richard's uh, first wife did write this book <coughs> called, I think, Love, Honor, and Disobey. And it was, and she 
says that there was Dicky Harris, and, and I knew that there was, it had been charted before that he was nicknamed in, in Ireland as Dicky. Um, but looking beyond that, it was trying to understand whether that was a different character. Mm -hmm. And certainly I felt that the, uh, the, 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 the Dicky Harris uh, uh, and the Richard Harris were two separate people. And funny enough, when we were in Venice, not to keep going on about being in Venice, <laughs> although I was as surprised as anybody that we went to Venice, um, but there was a film called Blonde about Marilyn Monroe, and one of the critics there was saying it was interesting, did you see the film? Oh, yeah. That the same idea was put in that film, which was this somebody that's famous creating mm -hmm. a different character. And in many ways, Richard Harris was creating a different character for himself, mm. you know, that was even bigger than the Dickie Harris back in, uh, back in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, yeah. in Ireland. And, and we were exploring that in the film. That's what we were trying to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, I suppose what perhaps easier to do then would be to, under constant surveillance by the internet, by people with camera phones, you could create personas more easily back in those days, you couldn't do that. Um, what about the songs? Um, what did they want from the film? Um, there's some sense of this that, um, that uh, Jared has said that he wanted to get away from that notion of the Hellraiser, which I suppose was Dickie Harris. I mean, that's the Hellraiser, it's part of what that creation was. Um, in your conversation with them, what did they want from the project? I don't know. I think they were quite cautious mm. about it. I mean, when I first, so Damien introduced me to him, but then as these things happened, I sort of became friendly with Jared and um, and Jared seems to be extremely affected by his father. I mean, they all are. I mean, you, you, can you imagine having a father like, you know, Richard Harris? It's, it's not, you know, it's not, not your normal dad, you know. Um, uh, but I think Jared has, has, has managed to, you know, grow into himself in spite of his dad. You know, there's very few people that are as good actors as, 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 as a parent that's an actor, and Jared has become one. But I think that he always had this thing that his father had not got the um, attention that he should have got. And I think one of the reasons why he decided that he wanted to be involved was to, if not reassess his dad, try to see his dad in a more interesting way than just go for the, for the hell-raising stories yeah. and all of that. And so that's how they sort of, and, I, and, and, and they, you know, we started talking about it, and, and it, it, that was part of how it came about. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you get a sense that they felt they were, to a certain extent, neglected, and in a sense, he was more of a father figure to younger actors out there than he was to them, who were all sent off to private school. Is that fair? Well, as far as I know, that the Dicky, as in Richard's yeah. father, uh, had all sent their kids to to private schools, or, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, Catholic schools, and they got sent to a school called Downside, yeah. which is, you know, the sister school to Ampleforth. And I think that was where Richard's way of saying that he could do just as well as anybody else, and he sent his kids there. But it was always also a negation of, a parent, of being a, a parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was accepted in those days that you could do that, you could send a kid away at six, yeah, yeah. And, and expect somebody else to bring them up, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then you would see them on holidays, and that's what happened to them. And, you know, he was living his life, you know. There's a contrast there, isn't there, really, that you get at, which is that he was so proud of being Irish and of being from Limerick, mm -hmm. you know, from an outsider town in many ways. And yet he aped a lot of those English establishment mores. He sent his children to private schools. He married his wife's fourth lady, the town was transpired. And so there was that conflict, wasn't, wasn't there? That on the one hand, that he, he, he savoured that earthiness of being Irish. On the other hand, he was quite happy to move in society. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think he was a champagne socialist, you know, that <laughs> term, but, yeah. but I do agree with you in the sense that Richard saw himself as, as, as sh you know, like John Lennon, sort of, you know, shaking the trinkets of the traditional English upper classes. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, marrying into them. I mean, I wouldn't be able to get inside his head. Very hard to get inside Richard Harris's head too, because he had such movement and, and life move. He went with what he wanted to do in the moment, but there wasn't a game plan or a coherent thought. 
And you know, the other thing is that I always find interesting when you deal with somebody like an actor who's really um, intuitively reacting and, and channeling other people mm -hmm. in their roles and stuff. I mean, at times Richard was channeling himself, but he didn't, you know, he would move in different ways, so there was no logic, I think. Mm -hmm. But but it is it is funny, I mean, the Rolls Royce, we touched on it there, one of the things that, you know, he, you know, that he, that he, he, he took all the trappings of success, sure, sure. you know, mm -hmm. and then kind of, you know, in some ways you could say, you know, left a certain form of acting behind to become a movie star. Yeah. So I enjoyed some of the debunking that was on this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, by far the debunking, um, uh, the poor fellow in, in the Rolls Royce um, story who mm -hmm. still believes that Princess Margaret um, <laughs> yeah. passed the Rolls Royce onto him. But also I'm wondering, is this the first public debunking of, and it's a fascinating book because it's, you, you, you talk about the notion of creating a persona, and there's no better example I thought it was fascinating when they say they actually constructed the story in order to tell it on the red carpet, which are all the sort of things you think the publicists do now, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to have somebody of his vintage doing that. Is that the first time that story has been revealed as a... I think so, yeah. Uh, I, I think so. And, I, and it was quite wily of him, but... And, and, and Jared was really into it. He loved the idea of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it had been around. I mean, like Princess Margaret, you know, there were reports that Richard had had an affair with Princess Margaret, but Richard didn't, you know, the great thing about Richard, he's outmoded in many ways, and he's a person that lives in the 60s, yeah. and some of his behavior is, you know, questionable. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, he never seemed to cross a line, sure. which, mm -hmm. which I liked about him. So he was unabashed, you know, he was masculine, he was, you know, politically incorrect and all those mm -hmm. things or whatever, but he never, ever, transgressed as far as I could see and was quite respectful and the Princess Margaret story I thought, I thought was a good example of that. Although I did love it, I had to be really careful because being interviewed before I was, you know, it was like, it seemed to symbolize Harris sort of giving one to the English, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said that a few times and it, it, I realized it wasn't going down very well in Stone Court. Shaft in the Royal Family. Shaft in the Royal Family. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that I was channeling Richard because that's exactly what he was doing. <laughs> uh, someone just threw the microphones at as our questions, or will I be doing that? <laughs> um, I don't know. Who are you asking? Is there someone out there? I was wondering if they would raise their hand and say, no, oh, 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 yes, you can do um, So I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Me? Yes, I will say, yeah. I'll come to the audience in a minute and just stick around and see if I can go out and pass the microphone to someone and someone else. Mother, 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 mother. Um, talk a bit about the technical side of this. Um, you have to get together an enormous amount of footage. And you've got some fascinating stuff here from personal archives, obviously, and um, stuff from studios and so forth. How do you start on that job? Where do you, I mean, it, it really is a needle in the haystack stuff. I'm sure you've got to filter it then down to the, the, the digestible size it is now. The, the, the sons have actually just sort of boxed up their father's life and sent it to that locker. And although that with I'd sent them my archive producer went up and had a look. Yeah. I didn't really know it was up it was up there nor did they, really. And it's now gone to Cork and it's gonna be exhibited, Cork University, it's gonna be exhibited in Limerick next year, I think. But there it was quite a treasure trove of stuff and when Jamie came across that note that Richard had written, that was none of that was set up. Oh really? No, it wasn't set up. They didn't know that was gonna happen. I kind of knew that there were certain things and I was waiting for it to happen and it just sort of all fell in place. From the, so they had a lot of archive, but we found archive within that and he, the tour hadn't been seen. You know, he did this one man tour and with Phil mm -hmm. Coulter and that had not been seen, so that was great. But it was all mute, they had lost the sound. Mm -hmm. So we, I had to recreate that using records and, and, and linking it all up. There was all, I, I, I should also say that, you know, like Richard's voice was, we used, tapes from an Irish journalist called Joe Jackson, yeah. who you may know, and I think Joe's here. Yeah. And, and, and they, were, they were brilliant, because what Joe did, and, and we wouldn't have been able to make the film without it, mm -hmm. was he managed to interview in a, Richard in a way that he hadn't been interviewed before. So he, was, uh, he, he managed to get Richard to talk about his life in a way that he wasn't performing 
as Richard Harris. Right. And what made and so when Joe allowed us to use his tapes, and and, and you know he he can tell us about that. Um, it gave me the opportunity to use that, and it was really at the heart of the film because it it gave Richard a voice that was not the voice you expect from Richard Harris. If you Google Richard Harris, you get lots of chat show stuff. Jonathan yeah. Ross, Letterman, you know, and he's telling his stories, and they're good fun, mm. and it's great, but it's not, it's not the, the stuff of documentary. It's performance. Yeah, yeah. and so jo that's why Joe's takes are so good. And Phil, would you say a few words about, about the experience? Sorry? Would you like to say a few words about the experience with a microphone? Yeah, yeah. okay. If you just tell us what it was like interviewing Richard Harris. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Actually, Adrian, uh, it was watching the Jonathan Ross show in 1987, about two weeks before I interviewed Richard, that I realized there was something inauthentic about his performance. It was the same, he had a repertoire of 20 great funny stories, but as a fan, they bored me shitless by that stage. And I thought, I'm not going to sit with the man for 90 minutes and listen to variations of this. So I went in in a very competent way, challenged him to. Uh, he, we almost got into a fisticuffs for the first 20 minutes because he didn't tune in to what I was trying to do. He thought I was just a cheeky bastard. <laughs> and he said that to Noel Pearson afterwards. Mm -hmm. But the punchline was, he said, uh, no, this is Joe Jackson. We just did a brilliant interview. He was cheeky at first, but that's okay. He reminds me of me. <laughs> and I think that's what he was tuning into. That's what was so good about the... Is he, because he's questioning himself. And so what, as a documentarian, what you have is, I have lots of other things like 60 Minutes, lots of interviews, but he, they, no one was challenging Richard. I mean, you know, Richard is not somebody that you would instantly want to challenge, even in later life. And you, you interviewed him three times over a long period of time, because he was physically dominant. Yeah. And you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't want to sit, but yeah. what Joe did is he did ask him questions that he wasn't normally asked. So, and it gave him a timbre in his voice that he was questioning himself. Mm -hmm. And that really worked, I think, brilliantly for the documentary and, and worked so well from Joe's tapes. Yes, that's true. There's all an inquiry going in, going on, which at, at the end of the film, he addresses with that poem. What I do is I, and it's, yeah, that's all there. Um, uh, and also a question that I'd like to raise. Thank you, Joe. That was very, that was very good, thank you. Um, and they have a question, raise your hand. Yes, definitely, yeah. My question, Thank you. Um, I, I remember an interview he did on Parkinson's show. It must be sometime in the late nineteen seventies, where he really laid it on about coming from a poor background. And, and uh, to illustrate this, he said, we, 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 "Our toilet was halfway down the garden," which I could kind of relate to because I grew up in a house in South Wales that was like that. So I mean, when you find out later on, he in fact came from a relatively Privileged background, it was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's surprising me. Really. You, you wondered why, I mean, he must have known that, that, that back home in Limerick, people would have seen through this. Uh, so, I mean, what, what was he, what was his thinking there? I actually think that he played around with things like that, but at the same time, he was pretty honest because uh, from the research that I did on him, he actually told Parkinson in 73 that he didn't have the luxury of, a, of, of coming from a working class background. He came from a wealthy background, so he's quite upfront about it. And there was one thing that was really interesting within this, it, it, you know, the people in Limerick are obsessed with rugby. Oh, yeah. And there was this idea that, so Richard played for a, a side called Gary Owen, which is kind of a posher side. And then he changed his allegiance to Young Munster. I've said Munster before, which is wrong, it's Young Munster. And young monster are a slightly more working class side. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, you know, a lot of, you know, so he changed that and people seem to feel that that was because he wanted to put himself forward as a working class hero. And at times he did play that, certainly in, in, in when he was doing his early theater and stuff. But I thought that it was very honest that uh, actually we found out and, and, that, and, and it's that the reason why he changed his allegiance was not that he wanted to look like he was a working class hero. It was because when he had TB and was ill, the guys from Gary Owen didn't come and see him. Actually, the guys that he played against, Young Munster, did come and see him. Wow. And so
so actually he had started to have an affinity with a more, you know, with those guys, and that's why he changed his allegiance in his for who he supported. And so I don't think that he did try to claim that he was working class. That, that's my take. Just it could be wrong. Uh, how did he get on with Richard Burton? He loved Richard Burton, but I think that they were probably so smashed that he <laughs> couldn't really talk to anybody. You know. yeah. But no, I think that they, he had a close, uh, not a close friendship, but all those guys. I mean, drinking was part of it for them. And, you know, again, in Joe's tapes, it's really interesting. He goes into more detail than I do. I let Richard say that he enjoyed it, and that was pretty well it. You know? Well, I think that's a good thing to do, though, I think, because there's much evasion about that issue. Quite refreshing to see someone not come out with the old I drank because of my father didn't love me or I drank because of this or that. Oh, Christ yeah. himself and say, well, we had a bloody good time, yeah. which I'm sure we clearly did. But I think that, the, you know, what we were hoping to do with the film was say something universal about parents because a lot of us have, you know, it's very hard not to have issues with your parents. It's a hard job and there's, there's stuff. And drink and, and, and a and abuse and substance abuse is something that is paramount in that and very, you know, can affect those relationships. And I think that that's why Jim Sheridan was so important in this because he had his own dealings. And it was like we were, there was lots of people that were dealing with the issue of their father within this mm -hmm. film. You know, that's uh, the audience. Sorry, Adrian, can I ask? You looked like you were going to continue. That line where he says we weren't running from any anything. Mm. On the tape, he actually admits later that he was. Was that were you going to say that? Well, you know that the thing about it with, yeah, but what Joe is talking about within his tapes, he went further into the uh, the um, his alcohol and why he did it and what the reasons were. Mm. For me, although I think it's fascinating, and you can probably tell it much better than me. <coughs> interviewed him uh, at the time. I just steered back. My dad was actually an alcoholic too, and uh, you know the funny thing is, is that when you got closer to trying to understand why it was, it made no difference to how I felt, yeah. right? right? And it made no difference to the relationship with him. He could then you know, he was still sort of hiding bottles of booze, right? And funny enough, the younger son, we cut out a sequence where we had the younger son in a place of the coal hole, which is where Richard used to go and drink when he was older. And Strand. Yeah, that's right. And he said that he really loved it when his dad started drinking again. And I was like, why? And he said, because I got to really talk to him. And before, it didn't feel real. You know, and, and then he really opened up to me. So there was that. We didn't do that because the sun appeared at the end. And with, when, when you make a documentary, you just have to decide in your moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the alcohol thing, Richard Harris is, is, is fascinating. Um, Could you that, that talk on, about... Just wait um, for the microphone stretch for one second so that everybody else can get the question. There we go. Talk about homosexuality in terms of this documentary. Let's hear a little speech about it. Homosexuality? It, it was a big subject. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and he made a big very good documentary. And I just would like for you to talk about it where it creeps in this way or that way or was it something here? Or just tell me there was nothing. There was well, absolutely, it, you, it never crossed your mind. What, Richard Harris's sexuality? You made the documentary. And I'm just asking you, you know, there he is singing with orchestras and playing all these parts. And where's the homosexuality? Here, give us a speech. Oh, well, well, I don't know whether I can give you a speech, but having, uh, funny enough, having been to an all boys school run by Benedictine monks, you know, homosexuality is not something I'm unaware of. <laughs> <laughs> However, not. You know, so, so, and I think Richard, what impressed me about Richard Harris is he seemed to have that thing that Marlon Brando had it as well, where it didn't really matter to him about man, woman, whatever. Mm. He was quite relaxed with it. So in his relationship with Lindsay Anson, who uh, was the premier theatrical director of the day, mm. 
and Richard Harris, this guy. Sporting, sporting life, life did this guy. Well, he directed Sporting Life, but he was he was a theatre director mm -hmm. of Royal yeah. Crawl. And what's so impressive about Richard Harris, and that's why I did quite a lot of the theatrical stuff, is Richard was this guy that came from literally nowhere and 10 years before and ended up on the West End stage really brilliantly. You know, like Arthur Miller saw him and, you know, cast him for one of, one of his plays. But their relationship was very intense mm -hmm. and obviously was based in Lindsay was homosexual. Uh, but Richard was totally comfortable with that. Um, and it, actually the film has got sort of, it's quite, you know, the, I don't know whether you can still use the term homoerotic, but it was, there was, in fact, my editors here, Greta, and I was constantly telling her to cut away from the scenes in the uh, baths afterwards in Sporting Life, which are, are really quite, mm -hmm. you know, they, there's quite a lot of cutting away to Richard running around with, you know, you know, skimpy towels and whatever. So I suppose that in connection with homosexuality in, in this film, there's there's certainly parts that uh, it's there, you know, I would say. And you have a question that flows in the next five minutes or so. Um, yes, from there is a couple of Do you think he was influenced by Marlon Brando on the side of uh, Eugene Hodanti? Uh, it seemed to me that it was decided to be quite earnest and serious in getting that film, and then afterwards he might have let him let it out to be a bit more liberal. I mean, Brando is one of the unwritten stories about Richard Harris, and and in the film, I really struggle with that, and I really wanted to do it because the truth of the matter is, is that it begins with Leela, as she says, that Richard was playing uh, on the waterfront, which is this seminal film that affected all the actors of that period. Um, uh, standing, uh, 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 well, I won't get into that, but so Richard was playing that. And then so he managed to get his name above with Trevor Howard and Marlon Brando on this film. He'd done about seven or eight films before that. And the, you, you know, if you go to the RTE archive, you'll see him being interviewed by somebody and uh, that, that seems to insinuate that Richard had come from nowhere and was an overnight success, but apparently he wasn't. He'd done this, he, he'd done Music and Bounty with Brando, but they actually got on really badly. And uh, during it, because Brando was so difficult, you just sit in his trailer. And Sandy, the agent, told a great story about Richard. They were doing reshoots, and Richard going and standing up to Brando and saying, "You don't, you know, you don't do that to people. Get out, do your stuff." And they really went to it. Um, but then, you know, cut to a few years later, they became quite good friends, and they s started to see each other and and and, and uh, was such. And they both went into their in the seventies. Richard did therapy, and Brando did therapy all the way through. That's what Listen to Me Marlon is based on, is sort of him doing tapes and talking about his own sort of oh. stuff. Then Listen to Me Marlon is a, 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 a documentary about uh, Marlon Brando, which is great. So there was a very interesting interplay between the two of them, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, he was hugely influenced by him, but then he, I think he sort of, you know, was on level with Brando at certain times too, but we, we couldn't get it into, into the documentary, you know, there's a, you could have had a six-part Netflix series on Richard Harris. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe expand into a, 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 a yeah. fattened up version that would be great to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else? You, you mix an interesting contrast with, with Sean Connery, too, isn't he, in, in the Molly Maguires? I love the Molly Maguires, and I wanted to include that as well. I think it's a really <laughs> underrated film. It did yeah. really badly at the time. It's basically about the... Um, the Irish immigrants that in, in America that are, are, are working in the mines, and then a group of them decide to actually start blowing up the mines because they need the mists. And Richard actually plays a turncoat, so he, he plays somebody that goes in and reveals them. And it's a very good film. And he became fast friends with, with Sean Connery too, who's much more sort of straight in the way than Richard, in all senses of the word. And uh, they do become very matey. But again, that bit with us, what happens next to the film, um, I imagine, it's going to Sky, so if you want to see it again, you can download it for German from that particular service. Um, you've been to Venice, where else in the world have you been with it? Well, we, the, the film was actually, you know, it was quite hard to get made, the BBC didn't want to do it. Um, you know, Sky backed it, which was great, and Screen Island, and it's really an Irish film, and was made by, I think I'm the only English person on it, to be right. honest, uh, which is great, because it is an Irish film. Um, but 
we've had a great time with it. So we went to Venice, and then there was a festival in Newport Beach, and it won a jury award there. And then it's just been in a festival in Florida that Jared went to, that, and it seems to have got another thing there. And so we've had a good life, and then we were at Cork just yesterday. Was it yesterday? I think it was. Yeah. Um, and that was, I love that, because it was in the, this place called the Everyman, which is beautiful. I did notice my little bouquet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slightly disturbing. <laughs> but, but ignoring that, it was great to have that there and then here. And I wish I'd actually watched it because this cinema projection is great. Yeah, yeah the screen is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Aidan. And thank you, audience, <laughs> in the audience. And all <laughs>